How many of you, you've ever tried to walk in the dark? How many of you have ever been walking through your house in, in, in the dark and somebody, other than you, because of course it wasn't you, but somebody left a toy out, somebody left a door uh, ajar or closed, or somebody left a cabinet open or a drawer out, and in the darkness, you don't see it, what happens? You fall, you stumble, you hit it. The Bible talks about people who, who don't know Jesus, who are, are stumbled, they're stumbling around in darkness in their sin. But God's word is like a lamp. It, it's, it's like a light that illuminates our pathway. That we don't stumble around in darkness, falling into sin, falling into hardship, falling into struggles, but that the word of God illuminates our path and helps us to see the steps we ought to take and shows us the steps we ought to avoid. But if we're not in the Word, if we're not studying the Word, it's like stumbling around in darkness. I remember one time um, I was walking through the chapel late at night, and that's a really dark room at night, and someone had just moved a chair right out into the middle of the room, and I have no idea why they did. Maybe they needed prayer or something, but anyway, I, I just ran into that chair. And then I had to have, like, God's grace fill my heart for that person. And <laughs> maybe repentance asked afterwards, but God's word lights our path. You know, oftentimes, many times during a day, we have to make decisions. Sometimes in the middle of a day, we have to make big decisions that we didn't anticipate and if we don't have God's word guiding us and leading us, we can just misstep. We can fall into traps of the enemy, fall into folly. Uh, but with God's word, he lights our way. We can avoid the traps. We can move forward in our walk with the Lord. The second thing that the Bible tells us about itself is that God's word is like a sword. Can you say that? God's word is like a sword. The middle section is doing good. All right. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is a weapon. This is the weapon that God has given us as believers to do battle against the enemy. The, this passage of Scripture in Ephesians 6 talks about that, that our, the weapons of our warfare aren't physical that our enemy is not physical, but that we as believers are engaged in, in spiritual warfare, in spiritual conflict. And the weapon that, the, that God has given us to, to, battle, to do battle against the enemy, to do battle against Satan, is his word. In Luke chapter 4, we see that Jesus is in the wilderness and that Jesus is tempted by Satan. Jesus fasts for 40 days and Satan comes and he appeals to Jesus' flesh. We believe that Jesus was both God and man. And so Satan appeals to Jesus' flesh to try and tempt him to sin. And how does Jesus combat the temptation of Satan? The word of God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, do not tempt the Lord your God. It is written, you shall only worship the Lord and nobody else. This word is our weapon. I like watching videos on YouTube. I like watching videos on YouTube of people doing things that they ought not, they, they don't know how to do, and it, it causes them to hurt themselves sometimes. And one video I like, yeah, I like watching people fall down. I, maybe I'm sick, I don't know, but <laughs> like people falling off a skateboard, bicycle crashes, things like that. I, I just, I think it's funny, I'm sorry, but especially when they shouldn't be doing it, right? When it's just so obvious that they shouldn't be doing these things. Well, one, of, one video you can watch, lots of them, are people trying to use these, uh, these ninja things called nunchucks, like these sticks that you swing. And you can watch hours of people hitting themselves in the face with it. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's comical to me. But... If you're in a life and death situation and that's the weapon that you need to use to, uh, to defend yourself against the attack of your enemy and you don't know how to use it and you're just, you, the enemy just has to sit there and watch you laugh because you, you're hitting yourself with it. You're, you don't know, you're not skilled with your weapon. 
I want you to know that spending time reading the Word, studying the Bible, is how you sharpen your skills with the weapon God's given you. And that if, if we don't pick this up and read it and let it permeate our hearts and in our lives, when the attacks of the enemy come, we will not be skilled in defending ourselves against the attack of the enemy. God's word is the sword. It's a weapon he's given us. We can stand and declare to the enemy, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Amen? Get in the word. It's your sword. Number two, three. Number three, God's word is like a rock. This is the passage I asked you to open up to today. Uh, Ephesians, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus is saying that his words, the word of God, is a solid foundation. It's a solid foundation. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. We're all building our lives on something. We're all building our lives on something. Some of us, we build our lives on our reputation. Some of us build our lives on our ethnicity or our family background. Or we build our lives on our hard work and our work ethic. We build our lives on, on our skills, our talents. All of that is like that shifting sand. Really everything other than Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone in the word of God, is shifting sand. Not that those things aren't bad, but we cannot build our lives on those things because the storms of life are coming. See, that's, the truth is that it doesn't matter whether you build your house on the word of God or you build your house on something else. What's promised to us is that storms are coming. The storms of life will come. And if when they come, we've built our life on anything else than the word of God, what we have built will not stand. If we build our marriage on anything else other than the word of God, it will not stand. And so God's word is like a rock. God's word is that solid foundation. Number four, God's word is eternal. Luke 21, 33, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This, this world will pass away. The Bible talks about that, that in the end there's a new heaven and a new earth, but Jesus' words will never pass away. God's word will never end, will never pass away. It is eternal. When you open this book, when you begin to read the word of God, when you study God's word, you, you tap into something that is eternal, something that transcends time and space. You're, you're tapping into another dimension that will never fade away. I don't, I don't pretend to have that all figured out or understand that. But there's, there's more to life than just what we physically can see and taste and feel and, and know. I think we would all agree about that. And when we open God's word, we, it's not just the physical words on this page, but it's this, we're tapping into something eternal, something that's spiritual, something that is tra transcends time, transcends space, transcends this physical dimension. God's word is eternal. God's word is powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and of marrow. It is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is powerful. 
You're not, you're not doing battle with the devil with a, with a uh, plastic uh, knife, you know. You, you've got a sword. You've got a weapon. You've got something that's powerful at your disposal. And it's powerful in doing warfare against the enemy. But it's also powerful in, in making us like Jesus. It's a two-edged sword. It, it, it cuts uh, the enemy, but it also pierces our hearts. That it divides between soul and the spirit. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I can't tell you how many times I'm, I read the scriptures and the Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin. When I'm, when I'm reading the scriptures... I'm asking the Lord, every time I open the scriptures, I say, Lord, convict my heart. Lord, make me more like you. Lord, help me. Let, let this word penetrate my heart and in my life. Discern my heart, Lord, where there's sin. Reveal it to me. Where I'm falling short, show me. Reveal it to me. Lord, if my thoughts and, and my motives are not pure, reveal it to me. The word is that, and it's powerful in doing it. The word of God is effective. Isaiah 55, 11. So my word, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it accomplishes that which I purpose and shall see, succeed in the thing for which I send it. The word of God is effective. The word of God, these two go together. It's powerful and it's effective. The word of God is not like a garden hose that you're trying to fight off the enemy with. It's powerful. It's effective. It accomplishes what it sets out to do. Do you believe that? That the word of God, that the scriptures are effective in accomplishing what they're set out to accomplish which is namely to reveal Jesus to us, to convict our hearts of sin, and to make us more like Christ. The Word of God is effective in doing that. The Word of God is inspired, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. This is, this is the, the, our core foundational belief at Destiny Church. This is the core of all of our doctrine, of all of our beliefs, is that the word of God, that this Bible is inspired by God. This, this is what we build everything upon. This is, this is what it's about, that it is inspired, that it is perfect, that it is without error. Because God is perfect. Because God is without error. And the truth is that the word of God, this isn't one of them, but the word of God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word is eternal. When we get to heaven, the word is the same. It, it, is, it doesn't change. It doesn't need to be revised. It doesn't need to be um, changed and updated for. Uh, the 21st century. No, the truth is, and what this scripture teaches us, is that instead of the scripture needing to change, what needs to change is us. That when scripture is one way and my life is the other, it's not scripture that needs to change. That God's word is inspired and makes us realize what is wrong in our lives and corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right? God's word is seed that bears good fruit. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells this parable of the seed and the sower. How many of you remember this parable of, of, of the sower sowing seeds? And some of the seed falls on good ground, some of it falls on bad ground, some of it bears fruit and some of it doesn't. But at the end of the parable, his disciples come up to him, as they often did, and they said, uh, Jesus, what are you talking about? And Jesus explained to them, the seed is the word of God. The seed that's being thrown out is God's word. And God's word 
is seed that will bear good fruit in the life of a believer. God's word is seed that will bear good fruit in your life. Every night, every single night, I sit down with my kids and I open the scriptures with them. Every single night. We sit down, I put them in bed, we go through this whole thing. It, it takes an hour to get your kids ready for bed. At least it does us. I don't know what we're doing wrong, but anyway, it takes us forever. And by the end of that hour, <laughs> we, we went to strangle them a lot of times. It's just like, <laughs> just, just, just do what we asked you to do, please. Please. And since we enjoy it so much, we decided, hey, let's, let's throw another one in the mix. Let's just... Let's just go for this. Misery loves company, so let's just add more. To, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But, um, well, actually, I'm serious. But anyway, at, at the end, once they're finally tucked in and have their diaper on and we brush their teeth and Faith's new thing is she has to have mouthwash. She has to use mouthwash now. Um, she won't go to bed unless we let her use the mouthwash and so anyway, she has pleasant breath at night, which is great. Um, anyway, every night I sit down and I, I open the scriptures and I read it to them. Why? Because I'm just throwing seed out there into their lives and into their souls. They're, they're, she doesn't understand it. Honestly, sometimes I don't understand it. O honestly. Sometimes the Bible's a, sometimes the Bible's a, a confusing. You have to you have to chew on it. You have to have the Holy Spirit reveal to you the truth of it. But I'm sowing seeds into their lives, and every night we do this. Uh, we started it out of desperation because our kids at 9 p.m. were turning into the devil. I mean, it was just it wouldn't it was horrible. So I said, how do we fight the devil? We got to get out the sword. We got to get out the word. We've tried everything. We've tried everything. Let's try the Bible. Isn't that right? My wife will attest. One night it was just so bad. We're pulling our hair out. We've, we've, and, and we had already been praying with them and, and, and doing that. But I just said, I don't know what to do. Let's just let's try this. I don't know. It's like a Hail Mary punt, you know, it's just. But oh my goodness, what a difference it made. What a difference it's made in, in, uh, in my life. <laughs> and in my children's lives. Uh, Faith, she's only three years old. Um, she will not let me put her to bed without opening the scriptures. She will not let me do it. There's many times where I've been like, I am so tired. You are so tired. We, we need mercies that are new every morning. I have run out. We have run out. And man, talk about something that will absolutely melt your heart is when your three-year-old or your, your, your children say to you, Daddy, read me the Bible. I mean, hello. No, go to bed. You know, I mean, right? I mean, You just can't, you can't refuse. Her little heart, she loves the Bible. Judah, the jury's still out on him. We're, we're working on him. But Faith, she will not let me put her to bed without opening the scriptures every night. Every night. And so, parents, this is where I start meddling in your lives. Find times to open the scripture in your home. Find time to sow that seed into their life. I'm sorry, excuse me. Make time. Make time. Make it a priority. Draw a line in the sand. Take initiative. Be a leader. It's what God's called you to do. It's who he's called you to be. I got, I got one amen back there. Men, do not wait for your wives to say, hey, remember what pastor said. 
Take the lead. Take initiative. Just start reading the Psalms. Just start reading anything. It's all God's word. It's all powerful. It's all effective. This, this year, uh, I started with the kids. Uh, I'm reading through the New Testament with them. Started in Matthew. I started reading the genealogies. You know what faith, faith's big takeaway from genealogies in Matthew chapter 1? Judah's in your Bible? <laughs> Daddy, Judah's in the Bible? Yes, faith, Judah's in the Bible. Her name is in the Bible a lot, so every time we read the word faith, faith, da Daddy, I'm in your Bible? Yes, faith, you're in my Bible. My wife gave me a, a new Bible for Christmas um, that I'm reading through this year. And so I leave this one here at work because it's too big and it was hurting my back to carry around. <laughs> so I got a smaller one, a downsized. Um, anyway, this, this, this version that I, I like to read and preach out of is the English Standard Version. But I wanted to read through the Bible this year. I wanted to read something different, so I re I'm reading through the NIV. Well, apparently Faith doesn't like the NIV, okay? <laughs> she doesn't like the way that one sounds. Um, and so she, Daddy, where's your big Bible? How come, where, bring your big Bible home. She's developed a love and affection for the Word of God, for this Bible. She was in my office the other day and saw it sitting on my desk, and she said, Daddy, bring that Bible home. Daddy, I want you to read that Bible to me. I, I, men and women, moms and dads, Open the scriptures, read the word of God, view it as seed that you're sowing into their lives. Listen, we, yeah. We sow it into their life, but the Holy Spirit has to come and water the seeds. And so that's why we pray. So I read them the word and then I pray for them. Holy Spirit, water the seeds that I've sown into their lives. Holy Spirit, you, you got to give them the revelation. You got to make this thing go. But I'm, I'm throwing out as much seed as I can. I'm not just throwing one seed out there and, well, well, I want to give the Holy Spirit as much as he can work with in the lives of my kids because I know he's going to need it, okay? So that's, that's that. The, the word is seed. The word is trustworthy. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word in this book is, is true, proves true, comes to pass. We see that in fulfilled prophecy over and over and over and over again as we read through the Old Testament. We see the life of Jesus as the fulfillment of so many prophecies. And then there are promises and prophecies that, that we can take advantage of today in our lives. That the Lord is a shield to those who take refuge in him. That as I take refuge in the Lord, that he protects me and my family and my life. I can run into these promises for today. And that also, the, the, it's trustworthy. It shows us where we're going and how to get there. God's word tells us that the world was created through the, wor through, through the word. That God's word created the world. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was, not made, vis was made out of what, out of things, I'm sorry. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was, was not made out of things that are visible. God spoke the universe into existence. That, that, is the power of the word of God. That everything that we experience and see in this world was created, was spoken into existence by the very word of God. And we have it here at our disposal. Watch how powerful it is as you unleash that creative power into your life. The word of God produces faith, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. Are you struggling in your faith? Open up the word. You have friends who are having a, a difficult time accepting Jesus, trusting in Jesus? Give them a Bible. Give them a Bible. Go buy a nice Bible. 
Say, hey, Lord, just put it on my heart. I want to give this to you as a gift. You're my friend and I love you. As they read the word, as they open it, you don't know what God can do with that in their life. It produces faith. Finally, my favorite thing about the word of God is that it's all about Jesus. John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus tells the religious leaders of his day, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. Jesus says, you're looking for eternal life in the scripture. Hey, it's right in front of me. It's right in front of you. I'm it. The scriptures talk all about me. I want you to know that from the beginning of this book to the end, cover to cover, it's all, always, completely, totally about Jesus Christ. One of my favorite things to do now as I read through the scriptures is, in, especially in the Old Testament, is ask myself, how do I see Jesus in this? Because Jesus tells me that the scriptures are about him. I want to see Jesus. So I pray, Holy Spirit, show me Jesus as I'm reading through this. It's one of my favorite things to do. I want to show you a recap of, of the 12 things. i got a slide that has all of them. Uh, if you didn't like to take notes, you can pull out your phone and take a picture of it. Study these scriptures. Open up your Bible. See what the Word of God would do in your life. God's Word is a lamp. God's Word is a sword. God's Word is a rock. God's Word is eternal. God's Word is powerful. God's Word is effective. God's Word is inspired. God's Word is seed that bears good fruit. God's word is trustworthy. God's word created the world. God's word produces faith. God's word is all about Jesus. I want to close by telling you about a family member of mine that got saved reading his Bible. His name is Leonard Coote. This guy was, an, was agnostic towards Christ. He had grown up in the Church of England. He thought it was all uh, uh, fairy tales and make-believe. And he ended up as a young man moving to Japan to find work. And he took up residence with a missionary. And he began to argue with this missionary about the Bible. Oh, it's full of errors. Oh, it's full of fairy tales. Oh, it's just a bunch of myths. And so he began to argue, but he, he didn't know what he was talking about because he had never read the Bible. And so the missionary kept beating him in these arguments. And he didn't like to lose. And so he decided, you know what? I'm going to open up this book for myself. And I'm going to find, I'm going to go through, start at the beginning with my notepad. And I'm going to read through this book and write down all the errors that I find. All the contradictions, all the, all the fairy tales. And so he sets out on this journey and he reads through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Starts at the beginning. He reads through all of Isaiah. He finally gets to the book of Jeremiah and, and he sees this scripture, Jeremiah 17, 9, and it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And in that moment, the Holy Spirit of God pierced his heart, revealed to him his sin, revealed to him his, his desperate need of a Savior. And he talks about in his book, I was reading it earlier this week, about how he just became undone. How it, the, the, the sin and the stench of sin on his life and the wickedness and his separation between him and God had, was so clear and it was so repulsive and disgusting to him that he fell on his face on the floor and cried out to God to save him. He spent all night crying out to God. He, he went to work the next day and he came home and he spent the whole next day crying out to God for salvation. That's the man who started this church. That's the man who um, God used to start this church, who God used to start a Bible school, who God used to send missionaries all over the world. And I want you to know that this is why we believe in the word of God. This is why we hold to this so strongly at Destiny Church was because th this is, this is where we were, what we were born out of was the word of God being effectual in the life of somebody who wanted nothing to do with God 
who wanted everything but God. But God, through his word, revealed Jesus to him and convicted him of his sin. And so this is why Destiny Church is a word church. This is why Destiny Church will always be a word church. This is why every Sunday you come here, the scriptures will be opened and Jesus will be proclaimed. Amen. Amen. Amen.